Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you having a fantastic Monday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're going to talk about today, we're going to start things off light because today's show does get pretty heavy. We'll start today off with internet slash entertainment news because we had a lot of people asking, what are your thoughts around this Logan Paul KSI fight that's coming up? If you haven't heard yet, arguably two of the largest creators on the platform will be fighting one another on August 25th. It's going to be a boxing match. There are many experts believe that it will be the, if not one of the top viewed live stream of events on YouTube ever. And one of the big reasons everyone's talking about it right now is over the weekend they had a press conference that was uh, was something special. The event took place at LA Coliseum. It was emceed by Shannon Briggs, a heavyweight boxer. It drew a pretty sizable crowd in person. The views online were massive, just millions upon millions. Just across KSI and Logan's channel, I mean, those two videos got over 12 million views. And as far as the press conference itself, there there really weren't any questions answered. It was essentially like a a rough 30 minutes of shit talking. Logan Paul saying KSI has a small dick. Looks like you grew a little dick today, oh. but it's a little one. He then tries to rip off KSI's headband, kind of shoves him, then KSI kind of runs up on him. He doesn't punch him. He kind of pushes him. It gets broken up. And there were two main reactions online. Some who just ate it the hell up, and then others saying this is just a disgusting, stupid sideshow. And also because many boxing personalities have become involved in some way that is actually it reflects poorly on boxing itself. And you also have others saying that every single part of this seems orchestrated and fake, that it's all for a fame and money grab. And here's the thing. Yeah, maybe. Now that said, it still will most likely be one of the largest live events to date. As far as the ridiculous antics, yes, but I could also say that if you look to other things like the the 2016 McGregor-Diaz press conference, then of course more recently the Mayweather-McGregor press conferences where things got a little theatrical. But with McGregor and Mayweather, when you look at how much money was involved and how much those two benefited every single day, I would be calling the other guy like, thank you. Thank you so much for helping me hype this event that really should have never happened. And with neither Logan Paul or KSI being professional, Professional, I mean, it is very much its own sort of sideshow. A very profitable sideshow that many people will tune into because you either like one guy, you hate one guy, you hate both of them, you love both of them. Hell, and just some people who want to see how big this thing could get are also going to tune in. And really pending something really crazy or horrible happening, everyone is going to leave this situation most likely a winner. It essentially boils down to a very, very profitable collab. But of course, that is my personal takeaway from it, and I'd love to know yours. Then we had a quickie update around that Eminem story we covered last week. You might remember at Bonnaroo there were a good number of fans, including Andrea Russett, that complained that Eminem used a gunshot sound in his set multiple times. Many saying they feared for their lives because they thought the gunshots were real. But then on the other side you had people saying that it wasn't really a big deal, that he's had these sounds and other artists have had similar sounds in their music during sets for years. Then Eminem's team responded saying there weren't even any gunshot sounds, saying it was actually a pyrotechnic concussion which creates a loud boom, adding that they have used that specific effect for the past 10 years. But since then there had been a lot of talk of, okay, well will they remove move that sound now, you know, will they, will they kind of back down from it? We got the answer Saturday night at the Firefly Music Festival because just in giant, giant text, Eminem left a giant message reading, if you are easily frightened by loud noises or offended by explicit lyrics, you shouldn't be here. And I will personally say, as a lifelong Eminem fan, this is exactly the kind of response you would expect from Eminem, albeit with less profanity than than maybe you would expect. But I do want to pass the question off to you, what is your response and your reaction to this story in general? Uh, The people that were complaining, do they have a point? No. Does Eminem have a point? No. Is is it more a kind of commentary as far as where we are in America that people will automatically assume that it is real? Also, a side note while we are on the topic, uh, I'm not someone that's telling artists what to do or not do, but I I will just kind of throw this out there. If you are a rapper and you have the option to put a police siren in a song or not, I wouldn't hate if you didn't. But it's your music, you do you. But from that, I want to share some stuff I love today and today in awesome brought to you by SeatGeek. And SeatGeek, of course, is the fantastic ticket app that takes the confusion out of buying tickets for live events, whether it be concerts, comedy shows, sporting events, whatever. They give all the tickets zero to 100 scores so you know if you're getting a good deal or not. I've got the app on my phone and it is by far the easiest way to purchase tickets, whether it be something a few months down the road or something last minute. And it's kind of the perfect time to test it out. It's baseball season, there are a bunch of awesome concerts coming up. Yeah, tickets on sale right now for the Eagles, Childish Gambino, Taylor Swift, Drake, whoever. And if you want to make the smart move like many from the nation already have, go to SeatGeekPhil.com, download the app, make sure you enter in code PHIL, and they'll give you $20 off your first ticket purchase. And the first bit of awesome, and it is actually kind of news, The Incredibles 2. One, I'm including it here because I personally thought it was a fantastic movie. Sure, the main plot is predictable. Wow, I loved it, and it's not just because of the Jack Jack scenes, which easily do steal the show. I would even argue it's better than the first one. But also, two, Incredibles 2 is just out there breaking records. The record for the biggest animated film opening in box office history for domestic sales was Finding Dory, which came in at $135 million domestic, and The Incredibles 2 passed it with 
$1.2 million. Which also makes Incredibles 2 the eighth largest debut ever. Then we got a trailer for Kiss Me First, which is definitely not just Netflix's version of Ready Player One. Maybe, we'll see. We had Samuel L. Jackson going undercover on Reddit, Twitter, and Wikipedia. We had composers from Stranger Things breaking down the show's music. We had Vat19 dropping a 2,000 pound bath bomb. We got the season two season finale teaser for Westworld. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then let's talk about illegal immigration, this zero tolerance policy, and children being separated from their families. A few weeks ago, we talked about Attorney General Jeff Sessions and his zero tolerance policy. And of course, the massive thing here is that Sessions announced changes to how the government will handle families that illegally cross the border together, saying all adults will be charged with illegal entry, they'll be handed over to U.S. Marshals and sent directly to federal court, and then the children traveling with them will be transferred to the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which is part of the Department of Health and Human Services. And that office then refers the children to relatives if they're in the United States or to shelters run by private organizations. Whereas previously, we saw federal authorities opting to release entire families from detention rather than separating them and keeping the parents detained. And reportedly in just six weeks, close to 2,000 children have been separated from their parents. In fact, a senior administration official saying the Department of Health and Human Services has been taking in about 250 children per day since the enforcement of separating these children. Which is one of the reasons why the last time we talked about this, specifically kind of the, the, the fake news surrounding this story, we saw people sharing pictures of children in cages. It turned out those photos were of years past of underage children who tried to cross the border by themselves. One of the big points we hit on is an emergence of this kind of facility seemed very likely because children were going to start being more and more by themselves, even if they were with a family. And now, unsurprisingly, that's what we're beginning to see. There are new centers for undocumented children, and we have new pictures that show what it's like for the children living there. We've also seen a lot of talk about who's to blame for this separation. Is it the Democrats, like Trump's been saying on Twitter, or is it his own administration's fault? In a moment, we'll talk about the actual policy and law so you can see where some of the arguments are coming from. And then after that, we'll talk about who's been vocal on this topic. And so first up, let's talk about where these kids are right now, because we've seen the 2014 photos, but what does it look like today? Well, over the past two weeks, reporters have been allowed inside immigration centers designed for these children. And the first facility the media gained access to was a center called Casa Padre, which is located in Texas. And Casa Padre is a former Walmart. It currently houses 1,400 immigrant boys, including some that were separated from their parents at the border. Reportedly, most boys spend an average of 49 days at this facility. And some of the things we've seen in photos, some just reported by journalists. It looks like bedrooms at the center have no doors. We see four beds in each room, but since the facility has started to fill, sometimes a fifth bed is added. Beside each bed, there's a list of each boy's belongings, two shirts, three pairs of socks, three pairs of underwear, one polo, a pair of jeans. The lights go out at 9 p.m. every night. They come back on at 6 a.m. There's a mural in the cafeteria that tells kids to speak quietly, ask before getting up, and to not share food. There's also a school inside the facility, but since there's been an influx of kids, the school is now split into two shifts. The kids get two hours of outside time a day, one hour for physical exercise, another of just free time. The boys are said to be allowed two phone calls a week, but officials at the facility said that sometimes it takes days or weeks for the children to reach their parents. We've also seen murals of U.S. presidents with quotes near them around the holding facility. There's one specifically that's blown up around Trump. That one having the quote, sometimes by losing a battle, you find a new way to win the war. Then on Sunday, the media was allowed into another facility in Texas. This one, a processing facility named Ursula. Here, the media was not allowed to take any pictures or video, but they were provided photos by U.S. Customs and Border Protection. And today, we also saw Border Patrol release video footage to the media. Reportedly, this facility houses over 1,100 migrants, including children and parents. But detainees are split up according to gender, age, and family status. One for girls under 17, one for boys under 17, one for mothers with children, and another for fathers with children. But because the center is a processing one and not a holding center like Casa Padre, families don't always stay together. And for the parents that do get split up, they are processed at the facility. They are told they will be prosecuted. Then, instead of being taken to an ICE detention center with their children, they receive what is known as a tear sheet. And that tear sheet informs the parents they will be separated from their family and informs them how they might find their children. Also, another thing you'll notice about the processing facility, it looks much different than the holding one. There are no walls to the bedrooms. Instead, there are cages with mattresses on the floor and dozens of blankets. And of course, as this continues, we should expect more photos and footage to come. So then, let's talk about the blame game, the law, policy, etc. For the last few weeks, you've most likely seen Trump has said that the separation of children from their parents has been a result of a law passed by Democrats. Some of the tweets he's thrown out include, put pressure on the Democrats to end the horrible law that separates children from their parents once they cross the border into the U.S. Catch and release, lottery and chain must also go with it, and we must continue building the wall. Democrats are protecting MS-13 thugs. Or, there was also Democrats can fix their forced family breakup at the border by working with Republicans on new legislation for a change. And so the question pops up, is it actually the Democrats' fault, or is, is Trump saying that he could change this if the Democrats gave him what he wanted as far as wall legislation? Also, what is the law that Donald Trump keeps referring to? Well, the answer is a little bit complicated. The Trump administration seems to be interpreting a combination of a few legal rulings and concluded that separation must occur. And it mainly involves three things. The first one is a law against improper entry at the border. The second one is a decree known as the Flores Settlement. And the last one is a 2008 anti-trafficking statute. Okay, so as far as the improper entry law, it states any 
alien who enters or attempts to enter the United States at any time or place other than as designated by immigration officers shall for the first commission of any such offense be fined under Title 18 or imprisoned not more than six months or both and for a subsequent commission of any such offense be fined under Title 18 or imprisoned not more than two years or both. So that law basically means that the Trump administration can imprison any person who crosses the border illegally. And then we have the Flores Settlement, which is a decree that imposes several obligations on immigration authorities. They are one, the government is required to release children from immigration detention without unnecessary delay to, in order of preference, parents, other adult relatives, or licensed programs willing to accept them. Two, if a suitable placement is not immediately available, the government is obligated to place children in, quote, the least restrictive setting appropriate to their age and any special needs. And finally, three, the government must implement standards relating to the care and treatment of children in immigration detention. So here, the government essentially has three options. A, release families together. B, pass a law that will allow for family detention. Or C, do what the Trump administration is doing and separate families. And then finally, we have that 2008 anti-trafficking statute. And it appears that part of the reason Donald Trump has been blaming the Democrats is that it was passed by a Democrat House and Senate and then signed by Republican President George W. Bush. That law stating that certain unaccompanied alien minors be transferred out of immigration detention in 72 hours. And so the Trump administration and Attorney General Jeff Sessions are interpreting these legal rulings together and saying that separating families is the only option since they are prosecuting every single adult who enters the states illegally. And so essentially that's Trump's argument that his hands are tied here. Whereas what we saw with previous administrations is that they made exceptions prosecuting adults traveling with their children so they didn't separate families at the volume that we're currently seeing. And so that's the legal argument slash debate point. In addition to that, we've also seen a religious argument made by Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Last week, he used a Bible quote to defend the move. While speaking to law enforcement officials, he said, quote, I would cite you to the Apostle Paul and his clear and wise command in Romans 13 to obey the laws of the government because God has ordained the government for his purposes. To which many then pointed out that that was the same piece of scripture used to justify slavery in the past. We also saw Kirsten Nielsen from the Department of Homeland Security writing on Twitter, this misreporting by members, press, and advocacy groups must stop. It is irresponsible and unproductive. As I have said many times before, if you are seeking asylum for your family, there is no reason to break the law and illegally cross between ports of entry. Adding, we do not have a policy of separating families at the border, period. But we've also seen Senator Kamala Harris saying that Nielsen should resign. Saying, as a member of the Homeland Security Committee of the United States Senate for the last 18 months, which has oversight of the Department of Homeland Security, I have asked Secretary Nielsen and other DHS officials to clarify each of these policies because the American people deserve to know the truth. Adding, I have, since March of 2017, repeatedly asked for complete data on the number of children separated and what training and protocol exists for carrying out such separations. In response, the leadership of this department has routinely failed to provide complete answers to questions from me and my colleagues. The department's lack of transparency under Secretary Nielsen's leadership combined with her record of misleading statements, including yesterday's denial that the administration even had a policy of separating children at the border, are disqualifying. We must speak the truth. Melania Trump issuing a statement through her communications director, saying Mrs. Trump hates to see children separated from their families and hopes both sides of the aisle can finally come together to achieve successful immigration reform. She believes we need to be a country that follows all laws, but also a country that governs with heart. We also saw Laura Bush publishing an article in the Washington Post where she called the policy cruel and immoral, adding our government should not be in the business of warehousing children in converted box stores or making plans to place them in tent cities in the desert outside of El Paso. These images are eerily reminiscent of the Japanese American internment camps of World War II, now considered to have been one of the most shameful episodes in U.S. history. And we've also seen more and more Republicans speak out on this. Senator Lindsey Graham saying President Trump could stop this policy with a phone call, saying if you don't like families being separated, you can go tell DHS stop doing it. Senator Ben Sass saying while there's much to say about how catch and release policies led us here, family separation is wicked and needs to be stopped. Senator Susan Collins saying that the policy is traumatizing to children who are innocent victims and contrary to the values of the country. Representative Mark Meadows saying families need to be unified and that legislators need to get to the bottom of it and make sure families stay together. Also, Representative Will Hurd, whose district includes a long patch of U.S.-Mexico borders, said the policy is unacceptable and adding that children should not be used as a deterrent policy in the home of the free and land of the brave. But as far as will any of this change Trump's mind, it really doesn't seem likely. If anything, everything we've seen from the president today just seems like he's doubling down on it. He had multiple tweets referencing immigration in Europe, allegations that children are being used by some of the worst criminals on earth as a means to enter our country. And also today, while talking about U.S. space policy, he said, the United States will not be a migrant camp and it will not be a refugee holding facility. But ultimately, like all situations like this, we're gonna have to wait and see what happens next. But I do also wanna pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts on this story? Do you think that President Trump and Jeff Sessions are doing the right thing here or no, this is horrendous? To you, does it feel like he's using these families, these children as a negotiating point? And really just any and all thoughts you have on this story, I I'd love to see them in those comments down below. And that's where I'm going to end today's show. And remember, if you like this video, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button, maybe ring that bell. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.